Well, hells, bells. It's the ACDC Beyond the Thunder podcast. With your host, Kurt Squires, with Greg Ferguson and Eric Deal. For those about to talk, we salute you. Hello again, listeners. This is the show where high-profile fans get a chance to salute this extraordinary band by the name of ACDC. My name is Kurt Squires, and we've got Eric Kielb and Greg Ferguson riding shotgun in the studio with us today. And as always, we thank you for plugging in. Hey, Kurt. Hey, Eric. Glad to be back for another episode of Beyond the Thunder. Yeah, Greg, this is uh, interesting because we're once again separating these episodes into two parts because, let's face it, Simon gave us ample time to talk about his entire career, <laughs> didn't he? Yeah, he did. He was really gracious with his time and, and uh, really had fun. I think I had a blast talking with him and uh, just getting to know a little bit more about him and, and kind of his early roots in Manchester and, and all the way up to becoming the drummer for ACDC. I mean, what a story. Amazing, especially for 19, 20-year-old kid. Uh, I can't even imagine. <laughs> Seriously, can you imagine that? No, I mean... 20 years tr- old, and, and then you're like flying out and you're on stage with ACDC. Yeah, and I, I kind of was trying to put myself in his shoes, and it just must have been so overwhelming for him. He kind of alluded to that in part one, where he's like, I have to admit, I was kind of... A little homesick. This was I wasn't. Yeah. I had never traveled before, so yeah, we we got a little bit of that. And uh, I think in this episode, we're going to kind of focus on more of what happened after ACDC. Yes, that's right. So the cliffhanger or Simon hanger, we should say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, was you know the question: Are you the first band member to ever quit ACDC? And he was like, uh, so hmm. we, uh, we, Interesting. we thought it'd be fun to kind of pick it up after his career with ACDC because he had a whole other career with countless rock and roll stars. So that was quite interesting I mean, as well. Dio, UFO, Queensryche. I mean, the, the list goes on and he's had quite the career. So really fun to hear about that. Well, IIO, it's time to get those meat hooks back into part two of our interview with former ACDC bandmate and veteran drummer. Simon Wright, let's do this. Were you the first official member of ACDC to quit? Um, well, I don't know if I quit. It was kind of a mutual thing. They could see my interest was waning. Yeah. I felt terrible because it wasn't good for them and it wasn't good for what they were trying to plan and stuff. Yeah. We kind of mutually parted our ways there and, and that's no good for anybody. And thankfully, you know, it wasn't too long after, after that. I managed to hook up with Ronnie. Yes. You know, I couldn't believe my look. Yeah. That was such a great time. Was he poaching you at the time, or were you just kind of reaching out at this kind of ambivalent stage in your career with ACDC? No, he wasn't. You know, he was kind of up in the air. He, there was a bit of a crisis because they booked studio time to record the next Dio album, so they couldn't really, you know, move it. They had to, you know, use that time because there was no more time booked, I think, for the rest of the year there. It was all booked up. There was a little bit of scrambling going around, but my, my wife at the time, she knew Wendy, and she knew how much I admired Ronnie and his writing and his singing and his songs and stuff like that for years. Yeah, You know, I wanted something else. I didn't realize it would end up being so quickly after leaving. It worked out great. And you had met Ronnie on the Monsters of Rock tour at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. He was on the bill as with, I think it was Van Halen. Yeah. Yeah, I got sitting with him and talking to him, and he, he was just nothing but wise words and encouragement because he knew I was just a kid, yeah. you know, in this massive situation and stuff. And he, he gave me a lot of really good advice. And uh, plus, he was funny too, you know, he's really quick. Yeah. So, uh, and it was a real treat. I'd met him before that, only briefly though, but uh, yeah, it was it was just a great opportunity. You officially joined Dio in 1989. I felt like Ronnie really let you make a statement on that opening track. Yeah, he did. Lock Up the Walls was the album. The opening track was uh, was Wild One. We really didn't have a lot of time to mess with things, like I was saying, because the studio was coming up, you know? Yeah. That was a good start. I mean, it was nothing crazy over the top as far as you know, advancing my playing and stuff like that. But there was definitely more there in, in a lot of the songs that I could 
sink my teeth into and stuff. And he was nothing but encouragement and stuff. We used to talk a lot together about, you know, certain parts and drumming and all that. And yeah, it was really, uh, you know, interesting stuff. It was good. Yeah, that must have been a little bit more freeing playing the Apache style compared to Rudd. Yeah, it was great learning some of the other stuff, you know, like learning stand up and shout and uh, Last in Line and Holy Diver and stuff like that, you know, I mean, and then some of the Rainbow songs were in there, Black Sabbath songs. Fun. A whole different approach and different kind of feel. So wild for you because you saw Rainbow as a kid, right? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I saw him in 77 at the Manchester Apollo with uh, Cozy and Jimmy Bain and uh, Ronnie Ritchie. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. You don't see shows like that anymore. No, you don't. So by now you're in your mid twenties and you got this huge life decision. Dio swoops in, takes you away from ACDC. Well, in a, in a sense, and then he joins his mates from Black Sabbath. Were you like, "Hey, Ronnie, I just quit one of the biggest bands on the planet. What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I honestly, truthfully, I I didn't think that. Yeah, because I've gotten to know Ronnie so well, and it was just an opportunity for him. Yeah. It, it it was I, I i just wished him well i mean I, I really did because it was um for for a minute there 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 was kind of a little bit of uh uncertainty as to who was going to be playing drums in that sabbath and wendy mentioned it to me wow and i said, well what the hell would i be doing playing drums for black sabbath when vinnie apathy's there yeah you know even bill ward's around right you know i mean right what they stick me in the middle of that. You know, it's like, doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you would have held your ground, though. Oh, if I had, I would have, yes. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's not my point. My point would be, it just wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. Not only to me, but I'm sure thousands of people, too. So, you know. No, I just wished him well, and, and it, what a brilliant album they did. Yeah. And what was your reaction to um, ACDC moving on? They had uh, Chris Slade come in. What, what was your reaction to that choice? Oh, I wished him well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think I'd met Chris somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. I know there's a photo of the three of you guys. There's uh, Phil and you and Chris together in one photo. Yeah, a girlfriend of mine took that photo. So, yeah, uh, that was at the L.A. Forum. But I, I, I met Chris when I was in ACDC. I forget where it was. Oh, okay. Uh, because he was good friends with the drum tech, Dickie Jones. Gotcha. Who, who's still there now. He was my tech, Chris's tech, Phil's tech. He's still there? He's still there. He's part of the woodwork. Yeah. Unbelievable. Amazing technician and a great, great guy. That's amazing. So anyway, yeah, I met Chris and he was a great guy. And I thought, well, that's cool. Yeah. He's probably going to do a great job for him. Did you ever get to work on any of the Razor's Edge tunes, or were you out by then? Uh, we we rehearsed a couple, but it was just petering out, you know, so um, I kind of moved on after that. I know you weren't a fan of Money Talks. <laughs> I don't think I ever played that song. Oh, you did it? Okay. Yeah, it was definitely a different turn for them. It was definitely more polished sound. It is, yeah. It's kind of like going back to the older albums, I think. Yeah. You know, a little bit from what I heard. Yeah. You know, just the sound, I mean. I mean, they got songs in there like Thunderstruck. Right. Which I did a little bit of. Yeah. It's a great album. What can you say? I mean, it's ACDC. It's a great album. Well, we actually had Chris on the show. He had nothing but nice things to say about you. He's a good lad. He really is. You know, we always get along well. We always um, find ourselves taking the piss out of the songs, you know. Um, yeah. And we had, we had the word sheep. Because he's from Wales, right? And they got a lot of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> they got like dirty deeds done with sheep. <laughs> yeah. He reminds me of you in, as sort of an MVP drummer with a resume that reads like a baseball card of classic, awesome bands. Like with Elvis, for God's sake. I mean, he did some shows with Elvis. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, and, and obviously we know about Tom Jones and stuff and, I'm like, well, Jesus, man, that's a lot. Olivia Newton-John. Yeah. Oh, did he do it as he, well? He did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that much. But yeah, right. <laughs> he did play on the album. Oh, that's great. No, what a career. Yeah. Your career stacks up. You, you've you sat behind the drum kit for UFO, playing with Michael Schenker, Tim Ripper Owens from Judas Priest, John Norum of Europe, Jeff Tate's Queensryche, and yes, back to the ACDC straight ahead four on the floor beat with Rhino Bucket. 
out of LA, right? Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, tell me about Rhino Bucket. When they came out, they, I knew they were 100% influenced by ACDC's formula. Were they like yeah. fanboys when you joined their band? Like, oh my God, we have a member of ACDC in our band. No, no, not at all. They were like ACDC, you know, just so down to earth and good guys, you know. I mean, we got along straight away. I mean, they're just really cool guys. They're still still good friends today. So it's just good good friends and stuff. And um, and I think they did take a lot from from DC, but they, they had their own way of dealing with it. They, they had their own kind of slant on it. Yeah. I know that it sounds a bit like them, but they, they had their own way of it. I remember I went to one show and they had promo materials and it said featuring ACDC Simon Wright. And I was like, wow, they're really proud to have you in that band. They wanted to... I don't think that had anything to do with the band. I think that had to do with the record company. Yeah, they were pimping you out big time. It never felt that way. We all were just good friends, you know. It's not like they were, like you say, they were not fanboys. Yeah. They were, we were just good friends. We had good laughs. Well, you had mentioned um, Queensryche. So let's skip to 2013. You joined Jeff Tate's version of Queensryche, known as Operation Mindcrime which was pretty progressive drumming compared to your early gigs. It seems as though you got what you asked for as far as the ability to kind of break loose. Where It must have been an awesome kind of um, educational experience for you. Yeah, it was. I mean, it took some figuring out. You know, you sit at home, I had a little practice kit, and, you know, you try and figure it out. And then we got together for the rehearsal, and it was it was really strange because there's me, there's Rudy Sarzo, there's Robert Sarzo, there's Kelly Gray and Randy Gain. Kelly and Randy had been in the official Queensryche a few years earlier. Right. You know, that was cool. They're really great people. But we were all jammed in this one room with one light bulb above us. You, there's literally about a foot in between all the instruments. You know? <laughs> so, you know, we blasted away in there for probably, I think, two weeks, three weeks, maybe. Um, that was up in Seattle. Yeah, yeah, we got the job done, and it was—it's amazing when you hear a song and you think you know it. You know, I found this a lot when I'm having to learn other people's material. You know, you're just tapping along and stuff, and you, oh, I can't, yeah, okay, that's that. That's the that's the chorus. That's the that's that that chorus is longer. Oh, the middle eight's longer now. Okay, so you know, there's little things you notice, but then sitting behind a drum kit trying to actually play it. Yes, it's it's a whole different thing something you have to sit down and get right singing the national anthem was jeff tate and we were just blown away by his vocals that's a loud stadium but to, he was louder than the crowd i was like whoa this guy's got some pipes how did you like working with jeff i enjoyed it he's a great guy he's a very intelligent man with a great voice i mean uh yeah the notes he would hit he, he told me he said god i wish i hadn't sung those when i was like you know 21 <laughs> or whatever you know <laughs> Because they're so high, but he would get there in one way or another. Right. It was Jeff Tate's Queensryche, it was called. We did that for for like three years, and it was a lot of shows, um, which was great. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Did you ever have an incident where you missed a show or came close to missing a show? No, uh, but I did come really close to missing a flight. <laughs> Uh-oh. We did this festival. I can't remember which year it was. No, I can't remember. I'm sorry. But anyway, we did this festival in Holland. It was called the Arrow Festival. And it was a bit of an eclectic lineup. It was Roger Waters was headlining it. Then it was Def Leppard. Then it was Dio. Wow. And then I think it was like Todd Rundgren or something. Wow. It wasn't, but it was really a weird combination. Yeah. You know, we went out front and we're standing in the lighting tower and Roger Waters is playing, me and my drum tech and stuff, watching it. And it's quadraphonics, all sorts of shit going on, <laughs> the side of the moon and everything. But we'd been told that if we watched the show, we couldn't leave until the end because they, they blocked off the road to get out of the place with a big crane thing. Oh, yeah. So it got later and later, and they had trouble moving this crane. And we had like a, a 4 a.m. flight out of Holland into Germany or something. And we finally got to the hotel, and I'd forgotten my bag back in the dressing room. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So I, I was just panicking. And there were no other flights to Germany. It was just that one. So a friend of mine drove me all. She she drove like 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 the clappers, like a bat out of hell. <laughs> <laughs> all through these little country lanes, got to the dressing room, grabbed the bag, and, you know, there's mud flying off the wheels. She's 
slam in this little car. <laughs> and we got to the airport and I, I went through the, you know, gave her a big kiss, walked straight in the airport. Ronnie's sitting there and looking at me going, uh-huh. <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Yeah, you actually did two stints with Dio. The second one began in 98, where you played on Magicka, Killing the Dragon, and Master of the Moon, and then two live albums, which we noticed that they placed in your drum solo in the reissues, which is awesome. Yeah, I did see that. When it first came out, Ronnie and Wendy talked to me about it and they said, well, we're going to have to take a song out to put in your drum solo. Uh-oh. Or we can just leave it as it is. <laughs> and so I said, you, you know what, just leave it. it. It's fine. And they went, oh, they went, oh, God bless you, Simon. You know, <laughs> thought it would be a big problem. And I'm like, nah, it's all right, whatever. That was so nice of you. It eventually see the light of day. That's cool. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. You said at uh, one point you were going through a pretty trying period with a divorce and you wanted to quit music, head back to England, stop playing drums for good. But it was Ronnie who told you, no, don't do that. Just come over, hang out at my place, get your head together. Tell us about that time. It, it ended up being like 14 years that you stayed at his place, right? It, it was. I mean, there'd, there'd been lots of people that had stayed at Ronnie's house. I mean, he, he has a lovely big house. It's a bit castle looking and stuff. And lots of different people had stayed there. And I was just freaking out. I'd never been divorced before or threatened be like that before. So kind of just rejoined Dio when all this started going down. And he was like, it was just nothing but encouragement. He said, don't, don't worry about it. Just come back to LA, hang on my place. You know, that's cool. We'll do some drinking, we'll, have, we'll do some more writing, you know, and all this stuff. So, you know, and yeah, 14 years later, I mean, it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Was that free rent? That would be awesome. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Although we did do some work, uh, landscaping and irrigation and stuff like that. But <laughs> I, that didn't seem like rent to me to be hanging with Ronnie and doing that. No, that's a pretty cool gig. Yeah. Then unfortunately, Ronnie passed in 2010 at the age of 67, which is terrible. But you pretty much took care of him during that time, didn't you? Yes, I did for quite a bit there. Yeah, about three, four months. And, uh, you know, I, I was I was cool with it. You know, it was, wasn't easy, believe me. But yeah. it was something that I sort of took pride in as well. You know, if there's anything I could do to help, I would do it. Because yeah. he'd been so good to me over the years, you know looking after me at the house and just being great to be in, in his band. Right. So, yeah, the nurse will come in in the morning about seven and I'd let her in and then I'd start making all these concoctions of like kale and strawberries and all sorts of vegetables and stuff and give him a big glass of this milkshake. He hated it. <laughs> Fucking drinking this shit. <laughs> You've got to drink it. You, you can't. It's going to help you. It's like, fuck. You know, just... <laughs> He's so pissed off about everything, you know, about the whole situation. He just didn't want to. He, he used to smoke a bit of pot, right? And yeah. So the doctor came up. I don't think I'm telling any tales here. It's just, <laughs> we'll find out. Well, whatever. It's, I don't mean any harm. I'm just saying how it is. It, you know, so the doctor came up with his brownies for him and he wouldn't eat them. I'm like, but they, they, they're good for you. They'll calm you down, you know, and stuff. Because yeah. he, he was in so much fucking pain, you know. Um, as I'm sure people who've been through this would know. Anyway, yeah, it was an awful, awful time. I'll never forget it. I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of people have been through the same thing. Yeah. But... You made a really nice eulogy. I remember seeing that online somewhere. That was really touching. We love that tribute you paid to him on the track of Catch the Rainbow. You did a great job on that. Thanks. Yeah, that was good doing that. I mean, it was sort of, what do they call it, cathartic. As Glenn... Uh, Hughes had known Ronnie and Wendy, Glenn and his wife from, you know, back east when Ronnie used to live back there and stuff. So they were good friends. Yeah. So Glenn came in and sung it, you know. He invited me down to, you know, because he did his singing after we'd done all the backing tracks and stuff. So I was with, I was there watching him sing it. And it was just like, Jesus Christ, man. It's like goosebumps on your arms, you know. Yeah, he's an incredible singer. I, I love that cover. I also remember the cover you did. Um was Back in Black with Joe Lynn Turner on an ACDC yeah. tribute album. 
And I have to tell you, I was a radio DJ for years. My handle was the ACDC guy, and I could play whatever I wanted. And I opened every show with your version of Back in Black. <laughs> you know, when we'd finished that backing track, it, it kind of got put to one side. Yeah. Because it was on an ACDC tribute album. I helped with getting hold of some people to sing and play guitar on it. You know, they were kind enough to ask me to help out with that way. But that was cool. That was a good time. But when we'd finished that track, it, we didn't know who was going to sing it. And then, you know, I think a couple of weeks after they said, oh, well, Joel and Turner's going to sing it. And I went, oh, OK, well, well this will be interesting, if anything. Yeah. I heard it and I'm going, what the hell is this? This is amazing. <laughs> you know, it, I didn't know he could sing like that. Yeah, we didn't either. Yeah. Greg ran into a very drunk uh, Joe Lynn Turner one night in Chicago, and uh, he was a barrel of laughs, actually. He was uh, <laughs> giving Greg an extra long hug. It was pretty funny. It was funny, yeah. Yeah, what a sweet guy, though. Really, really <laughs> nice and down to earth. Yeah, he is. He is. I, I was lucky enough to play with him. We went to Iraq um, and played for the armed forces, the soldiers and stuff. And, you know, I got to know him there, and he's just such a cool guy. Yeah. For some reason, for me, when I met him, when he started talking to me, I, I didn't expect that accent to come out. The New York accent? Yeah. He's like, hey, man, how you doing? What the fuck? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he'd be this nice, quiet, you know. Right. Yeah. You know, but he's, he's, he's roaring along now. You know? I, I know. I agree with you. Yeah. We spoke with Solo Dallas, who was also on our show, big ACDC uh, fan. Philippe. Philippe, yes. Um, who you played with on the Bon Scott tribute, Bond But Not Forgotten, uh, which yeah. was really cool. Uh, but tell us about Metal Gods, the ultimate ode to Judas Priest and Dio, featuring um, Tim Ripper Owens. My friend over there, James Morley, he, he used to play bass with the Angels, big Australian band over there. And he got a hold of me, got it years and years ago. I started going over there and stuff. He would line up Bon But Not Forgotten and stuff to celebrate Bon Scott's birthday. He came up with this idea about me, you know, me and Tim going over there and doing Priest and Dio, you know? I mean, just to break things up a little bit and all. And uh, yeah. it seemed like a great idea. And Tim, Tim was available because a lot of times he's doing solo tours and, and the like. So, and he's also in KK's Priest. So, oh, that's right. I totally forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So he, you know, he wasn't busy with that, with any of that. I managed to fit it in. So it's, it's worked out great. Looking forward to it. I'm, I'm assuming you put together the set list for the Dio portion of the show or no? No, actually, I didn't. Uh, James just sent over a set list and stuff and, um, me and Tim both looked at it and went like, that's that's very cool. It includes a couple of songs from, you know, Tim's time in Priest. Yeah, which is very heavy, very heavy period. Yeah, it's like a track called One in One and Burning Hell. Nice. So, yeah, it was, um, it, it worked out great. What's the hardest Priest song for you to play? I have a bit of trouble with Painkiller, so we're not doing that. <laughs> 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 that's great. <laughs> that's a tough one man i don't blame you yeah yeah one of my favorites is riding on the wind which is also a great drum track yeah that absolutely there's so many there's like stealer and rapid fire and yeah killer stuff you know i mean uh les binks and what was the other oh shit uh he used to play for trapeze dave holland dave holland that's it yeah solid drumming on there from him great it's really cool and scott travis what just amazing yeah 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 I'm actually going to the induction, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame of Judas Priest. All right, right. Priest, my second favorite band, so I'm very excited that you're doing this show. That's very cool. Killer band, they really are. I've loved them since I was a kid. Me yeah. too, me too. A lot of fun playing that stuff too. Is, is there a place that people can go to find out more about the tour or everything Simon Wright? I think they did set up a .com, so I think it's metalgods.com. Okay. Metalgods.com, and that's in Australia starting? Yeah, it's it's just in Australia for now. Um, there has been a couple of things about Europe, but it hasn't panned out yet. Okay. So, well, best of luck to you. That sounds fun. Thanks, man. Thanks. Should be. <laughs> well, um, ACDC Beyond the Thunder is a show about how extraordinary fans and even band members like yourself have been affected by this group in truly extraordinary ways. Are you now able to describe why this band is so special to people all around the world? What's their secret recipe, Simon? I just think it's it's hard to describe. It really is. I mean, it comes from Angus and, and from Mal. 
Yeah. It's a thought that they've definitely followed through on with regards to the style of the music and the, the way it, it, it kind of has a connection. Each album has a connection to each other. I think, you know, the sound is so unique. And how would they influenced you outside of the music industry? Not very much, I must admit. Are they just not not great uh, communicators? So you didn't take that away? Well, they did like to keep themselves to themselves. There were times when they would kind of, you know, break out a little bit. Yeah. Attending things and... Uh, right. Yeah, they were pretty private, pretty private band. Yeah, they, they are. They, have, they really are. I mean... Um, Brian does events and stuff and gets up and sings and stuff like that. And I was really surprised, you know, when Axel had to come in and do it, he did a fantastic job. But then Angus would, when all that finished, Angus would be getting up on stage with Guns N' Roses. And I I, I, I was amazed because he would usually never do anything like that. That was quite shocking. You know, it's all good. It's special. It's for the, you know, the fans will never, never really see something like that. It's, it's a real surprise, you know? Yeah. It was nice to see Brian play with, at the Taylor Hawkins uh, tribute yeah. concert. Um, I, I was going to ask you, who are some of the biggest rock star stars that come up to you nowadays and say, hey, Cy, what's up? Is it like Dave Grohl and Lars Ulrich, are they all buddies? Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, I see, I, I've since moved, but I used to live in the uh, in the San Fernando Valley here in LA, in a place called Tarzana. Dave Grohl has a recording studio up in Northridge, which isn't far away. So, I, you know, I'd be in the, the Ralph's supermarket shopping and my daughter would be with me and I remember there's one occasion, you know, she sort of stopped me and started pulling on me. And I'm like, you know, she's not a kid anymore. I'm going, what the hell are you doing? You know, <laughs> she's, dad, 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 that's Dave Grohl. <laughs> I went, oh, yeah, hey, hey, Dave, how you doing? Simon, how are you, man? And so it was like, <laughs> she was blown away. And because, you know, she's not in, she she's not involved in music. So right. she doesn't know certain people. So, you know, I mean, I, yeah, we we did a charity thing too. We do it well. We used to do it every year at uh, called Ride for Ronnie, and uh, all the proceeds go to his Stand Up and Shout Cancer Fund and stuff. And um, um, Dave Grohl came up and played and stuff, and it was just great to see him. He's just a he's so unassuming. He's just like a bundle of energy, you know. He's just great. He's a really great guy. The real deal. Yeah, yeah, you can tell. We've kept you long enough. We have, we're going to kind of round the corner for you here, but this has been really fun, Simon. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Nice talking with you. I had a, one last question for you. Uh, well, the, next to the last question. Given your tremendous resume, if Simon Wright closed the show featuring your entire career, what song would you choose as your encore? Oh, how about maybe Kill the Dragon? Nice. I figured <laughs> it would be a Dio tune. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. I know you get a sweet spot for for Ronnie. That that makes uh, sense. Yeah, DC song you could play like Heat Seeker or something, maybe if you wanna. Yep. Yep. Okay, that's no, a good song. No, I like your choice. I totally uh, expected that choice. That's great. So okay. Simon, we can't thank you enough for sharing your ACDC time capsule with us. An impressive career with Dio and many other excellent artists. You're you're truly a nice guy. Obviously, fantastic drummer. Honor to meet you finally. But before we let you go, uh, we leave you with our last question we ask all of our guests, which could be challenging. If you had to describe ACDC in one word, what would it be? Fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's two words. That's two words. We'll we're gonna Sorry. we're gonna use that. ACDC Beyond the Thunder theme song, trailer trash written and performed by Gannon Arnold. VO Talent by Bruce Jacobson. Cinematography and sound recording by Greg Ferguson. Edited and mixed by Eric Keel. Written, directed, and hosted by Kurt Squires. Produced by Greg Ferguson, Eric Keel, and Kurt Squires. ACDC Beyond the Thunder is a Squires LLC current motion production. Copyright Beyond the Thunder podcast. All rights reserved. This has been a Nat Attack presentation. Button and who nana.